Well, thank you, Udo, for the, in the first place, organising something that I think is long overdue and an incredibly important discussion for landscape architecture, yes, but also for the world. You know, this is something existential that I think we're discussing. And I think um, to, to just sort of touch on uh, Udo's in introduction, I, I do come from this, I, I have a, a hybridised background and it's really affected what I do. It's very much affected how I think, how I work. Um, and it's hybridised because I started off as an urban planner and then did heritage conservation and finally found landscape architecture, which gave me the tools that I, that I needed to do what I wanted to do. But also because I spent uh, several years in academia um, and in the course of doing doctoral research came across a lot of the ideas that have driven my work since then. Um, a kind of happy accident of my academic career was that I was almost finished my uh, PhD in 2010 and the global financial crisis hit and I couldn't afford to give up my job, so I gave up my PhD. And that has been an interesting driver for me because I had formulated all of these ideas that I hadn't, the, the final part of my PhD was a, a design exercise. Um, and I never got to complete that. And so I've used my work to, to complete that idea. Um, in what I'll be talking about today, I, I use this idea of killing your darlings. And I don't know how many of you have heard this idea before, but authors uh, talk about killing your darlings, of just editing, a process of editing, giving up the things that you're, you're really attached to when you think about a particular idea. And we all do that as professionals. And certainly, you know, through my education, my professional work, as a landscape architect, you come up across sort of tropes that we need to, we need to sort of address those. And that's kind of what I'm referring to here. Um, and, and a lot of what I've uh, talked about and tried to do is about giving meaning to the idea of cyborg landscapes. Um, and so I used to, when I was teaching, I, I used to teach a program that I called The Nature of Nature that questioned this idea of nature. What is nature? And so I would show images like this to my students and ask them, are these nature? And in, invariably, almost always, they would say yes. And I'm cycling through these quickly because I think you probably all kind of know where I'm heading with this. But th there, is a, there is a point at which people stop recognising human impact. And that's what, that's what this, this question was. You know, what is, what is ac actually, what is nature? How do, we, how do we understand it? How do we interpret it as landscape architects? And I would sort of draw to things like dictionaries that, defer, that actually um, define nature as everything that is outside of humankind. You know, and that separation of humankind from nature is a fundamental problem. And we find ourselves in a climate crisis where we're dealing with this problem that we think is outside of our realm. And that's the outcome. But you know, when you actually look at some definitions where nature is defined through its Latin root term as to be born, we are born, buildings are born, why do we actually see ourselves as separate from nature? And a lot of the work that I've tried to do is at the core of that idea because ultimately we do have human impact in all of these images. You know, all of these spaces and places, um, wherever they are, and any, I would argue anywhere in the world, have uh, human impacts. And so if you exclude humanity from it, it's not, uh, none of these are nature. If you include humanity in it, then it's a hybridised kind of nature. Sorry. There we go. I think the clicker is, is going to protest because I've got too many slides. So it raises this question of, is none of that nature or is all of it nature? Um, and I think that I, I sort of believe in this and, and what, what has sort of come through scholarly research in in the, the somewhat recent past, 
is this idea that pristine nature has not existed for somewhere between uh, 12 and 15,000 years. Uh, and that's based on science, you know, what, when we look at it, um, and, and if we look at, uh, say, uh, carbon data in particular, about 12 to 15,000 years ago, we started being an agricultural species, and agriculture shifted the entire biosphere. And that is, again, I think that, that comes to the root of we have to get rid of this um, trope of untouched nature, and our, our job is to restore nature. We are not restoring nature. We have already fundamentally changed it. What we have to do is actually change it in the right way. And so this idea of cyborg uh, landscapes and cyborg ideas is this idea that give away your, your kill, the, kill the darling of nature as a pristine, untouched thing that exists outside the city. So I essentially argue that everything is nature. The, the building we're in, the, the, the city of, uh, of Freising, we, we, it is all nature. And nature is a process that continues irrespective of what we do. The, the, the challenge we face is not a challenge to nature, it's a challenge to humanity. So what comes out of that, which is particularly relevant for all of us here, is what is landscape architecture. And I hate the way that landscape architecture is defined, particularly in, in, the, popular, in the popular press. Um, you know, we're, to summarize, treated as exterior decorators. And in practice, that is a lot of what happens. You know, as a professional, I often get asked to come in to do a landscape architectural uh, design to clean up with the leftover space. And that's just simply not what we should be doing. We need to invert the role uh, and, the, and the scope of landscape architecture to really, um, to really actually pinpoint the idea that we control the medium through which we can ag address climate change. And I think that's fundamental. I think if, if we take anything away from this event, which um, I think is, is critical to our industry, it's that we, we certainly need to think of landscape architecture at the, at the forefront of what we do as a species, not as an afterthought. Um, and I think, as, as I've kind of hinted already, you know, this comes to the idea of how we think about cities. And a lot of the time when I speak to people about climate change, they think, well, we'll fix it somewhere else. The problem is too big. So there are, the cities are over here, nature is over there. We will appropriate the resources and someone will figure it out and it's not my problem because it's too big a problem. And again, I think that that's something we kind of want to question. And you know, these are little exercises of just typing in cyborg nature to an a image generator. You, you sort of start to see the dissolution um, of where the boundary is. And I think that that's important. We need to do that. Um, so I think that, um, you know, rather simply, as practitioners, as academics, we, we want to uh, sort of fight against this nature culture du duality where urban development is seen as outside of the natural world. And, and my, what I'd like to try and do is actually um, think of the whole earth as a cyborg nature, you know, part technology, part nature. Um, and so this is where the, the title of the talk and the idea uh, it comes from. Get rid of the tropes of nature as, a, as something that exists outside of the city. Um, and I think that, that a lot of what we regard as you know, formative landscape architecture principles actually does it. You, know, you look at Central Park, it emphasizes the separateness between nature or landscape and the city. And it's an amazing place and it's incredible, but actually for what we need to do with, with turning our environments around, I don't think it's the, the solution that we seek. Um, and I'm really, uh, I'm, I, I quite like the quote by Stephen Reid here, who's a, a Dutch geographer, um, saying the city is no longer something we can understand as architecture, as a massive form material that we can distinguish from the non-material void which can be characterized as countryside or periphery, 
or as in any event, not city. Um, and I think that that is the, far and away the predominant attitude in architecture today. And you as professionals going out there have to actually, we, you will have to fight this battle of actually telling architects not to see uh, buildings as something separate from their landscape. And there is interesting things happening, you know. There's this sort of discussion about metabolic buildings that have a form of exchange within their buildings. Critical ideas that when placed or situated within a next nature kind of environment means that we potentially have solutions. Um, so I propose this idea of thinking of cyborg landscapes, but I'm, I'm really heartened and I love Ilsa's work. It is absolutely inspirational and disturbing and I love that it disturbs me, right? And, and I think that that art as a, as a practice should disturb us. If we see something that feels right and wrong at the same time, it's probably the message we need to hear. And I think in the same sense, the Australian artist Patricia Pacini um, creates these sort of installations that have these grotesque um, sort of things happening in them that talk to uh, genetic engineering, but ultimately the sort of hybridization of people, places, things. And I think Natalie had mentioned also the cyborg, uh, uh, Donna Haraway, and her cyborg manifesto was really fundamental in changing the way that I think um, about these ideas. Um, and, and there's a few bits of this that, that kind of resonate with me. This idea that nature and culture are reworked and, no one, and one no longer can be the resource for appropriation of the other. So stop thinking about nature as a resource for cities and the two things are separate. And if we actually, I mean, she's talking about gender and space and feminism, but she's also talking about um, cities. Um, and if we think about cities as our kind of Frankenstein monster, our cyborg, you know, we have a responsibility there. And she talks about this idea that the cyborg does not expect its father to save it through a restoration of the garden. So I think, again, um, we're never going to remove cities and restore gardens and then we'll all wander around in a loincloth in a jungle and then we'll all be happy and, and satisfied. No. We have to think in a way of we are where we are, we've created what we have, how do we solve the problem? Um, and I think there's been a number of projects, <coughs> excuse me, um, which, um, and I'm sorry, I skipped a slide then. We'll get there eventually, I promise. Yeah. Um, I, I like this idea, the simplicity of this expression. Um, we need to explore how we can design, build, and live in the nature caused by people. And I think as a, as a sentence, that captures it really well. Uh, and it's certainly something that I think drives a lot of what we should be doing. Um, and there is a few projects that, that led me to believe that, yes, we can do this. And the, and the first was the Big U. Think of it as a one billion US dollar park around southern Manhattan that was there because Superstorm Sandy wiped out lower Manhattan for six months. So if we think about this ecological infrastructure, this is, this is sort of uh, illustrative, right? Also, I had a, a brilliant Dutch landscape architect who used to work for me who hated this because she said, ah, it's just the polders, we've been doing it for 500 years. But that's actually also an important point. The act in history, if we look back at various periods of history, we have been the, those people that, that geoengineer our, our settings. Um, and so it's, it's projects like the Big U uh, and also, sorry. Um, other projects like the Oyster Texture Project. And for those of you not familiar with, you, with it, look it up. It was looking at a horribly polluted industrial waterfront and deploying oyster reefs, which had existed there previously as an ecology, but deploying them as synthetic ecologies to clean up the bay, to eventually, as a social engineering story, create an industry for the, the, the people to be employed within there and to eventually provide a food source. 
Um, again, something that sort of looks at deploying ecologies, synthetic ecologies in a way to solve a problem. Um, again, the, the Shanghai water city was a, was a really interesting competition that, again, dealt with a waterfront that was horribly polluted. And field operations, their approach was actually their, the first move was setting up the green fingers that you see here and a hydro, hydrological system that cleaned the bay. And then everything throughout the city was structured by that landscape framework. And that idea of landscape form frameworks as formative, I think, should be at the front of our minds. Uh, and, and I think also there's a lot of work that was were over the past few years that were done at the AA that looked at how landscape can create geometries, that we can think about function of landscape before we think of buildings. And I, again, you know, a lot of those ideas really sort of did resonate uh, with what I thought. Of course, I thought that many of these were things you couldn't do in commercial practice. Um, I, I also got, um, and I live in Dubai, um, and in a way, uh, and uh, Marcus, who's uh, sitting in the audience here from MSP, we worked on a project where we used a line from a Frank Sinatra song saying, if I can do it there, I can do it anywhere. If you can do it in Dubai, you can do it. There's no excuse to say you can't do it anywhere. And this project was built as a net zero project in Dubai where there's food growing on site, wastewater reprocessed on site, energy generated on site. So it really, to me, spoke to this idea that we don't have an excuse anymore. Um, so I think that... Um, that led me to this series of case studies that I'm going to run through now. And this pretty much runs from the time that uh, I was doing my doctoral research up until today. And, and there's a lot here, so I'm going to run through it really quickly if the clicker uh, help, helps me to run through it quickly. But I wanted to show this as a sort of just particularly to the, to the, the, the people who aren't yet working in the industry to encourage you to say, uh, question, try, um, be the one who tries and fails rather than the one who never tried at all. Um, and interestingly, I think we've been talking quite a bit about Singapore. I lived in Singapore for 10 years before I moved to the UAE. And one of the last projects that I did there, again, when I was doing my doctoral research, was the ABC Waterways Program. And it covered the western catchment, so 400 square kilometres of Singapore, with a simple idea that... Um, Every water resource, because Singapore is an island with seven million people on it, is fundamentally important. So what do we do with water courses? They're not to be drains. How do you, how do you make them ecologically function? How do you actually manage them so you then have development opportunities? And how do you, uh, how do you sort of think about it as a sort of open space framework? And just that, that simple adjustment of thinking at that scale of landscape as a formative system for the city was obviously um, really significant for me. And I was working for, me for, a, for an ecologist, defining these ideas of how these systems might actually transform the experience of living in a place and the function of that place. Um, I was at that time also involved in a a design studio that was one run by the University of Western Australia uh, in Dubai, where Dubai had announced that in its grandiose fashion at the time, uh, we're going to have 8% of the urban fabric uh, as green space within one and a half years. And it was at 1%. You know, it was very aspirational. So we took that as a, as a, a kind of uh, provocation for a, a design studio. And again, this was sort of looking at how do we deploy landscape as infrastructure? How do you make uh, places where it functions to clean water, to make food, but also as a way to sort of civilise a city or, or um, create a way to live the way you want to live? Livability in terms of access to green space, ways to move without a car, which is one of the city's fundamental problems now. Um, there, there was at this time, you know, this, this sort of openness to grandiose ideas. And so when they announced a free trade zone that they uh, 
called uh, Food City, we set about trying to define it in our own way. And we said, well, what, how can we combine an urban fabric with this sort of deployment of landscapes and the reuse of things like water and energy in ways that um, could have a self-sufficient community of 50,000 people? And so th this, this idea was essentially a logistic zone for food where a lot of the food was grown there, where the water was desalinated on site using uh, concentrated solar arrays, where 100% of the water was recycled. Um, and, and it was a fictional project. We made it up because we wanted to do something interesting and the global financial crisis had hit and we had nothing else to do anyway. So um, th these sort of thought experiments um, sort of became quite interesting and I, I sought these out over time um, because it started to help us think through systems um, and how, how the landscape is a, f is a framework for integrating systems. Um, and similarly, this was a, a, a part of the emirate next to Dubai that was a, a series of lagoons that the water quality was not good, the physical environment wasn't great, and we saw landscape as a means to understand the place as a functioning uh, ecosystem. And so we looked at the opportunities in, in this quite um, underdeveloped city for the public realm as a transformative element. Um, and it was really based on this idea that all of those green spaces needed to be community spaces, spaces that managed water, spaces that got you out of your car and into the places you wanted to be. Um, this next project was, uh, was something that, that we collaborated with Stoss Landscape Urbanism on, um, where we were asked um, this question of, you know, planning, um, planning a set of business parks around an airport. And there was three parcels of land completely physically separated around the airport. And our, our imagination of this was this isn't one place. This is, and if we are to think about it as one place, what is the way that we think about it as one place? Um, and so it was this idea of, you know, the city as a circular metabolism. Um, and we were really inspired by things like the Emerald Necklace in Boston and how we might actually uh, deploy that idea. Um, it wasn't something that we were asked to do. Um, it was something that we, we sort of put into our proposal to the client because we thought that there was greater, greater utility, greater use for those kinds of ideas than there was a conventional approach to master planning. And so we, we sort of researched the kind of ecologies we could deploy. What were the things that we could do? Um, and the, ultimately, what, what became the glue or, or the, the central unifying idea was this set of landscape typologies, both water, vegetation and landform, and what we could do with that, that would allow us to sort of transform this idea into this sort of eco aerotropolis you know. So we, we looked at how can we deploy algae to create algae biofuels for, for jet fuels? How could we grow all the food for, the, for these inhabitants there? How could we actually regenerate some of the mangrove areas that were closer to the waterfront? So this became a, a tool, a mechanism to say, here is the defining idea of this place. Um, and so as I was saying before, we sort of started th thinking through um, what this meant as a set of landscape interventions. We really did not pay a lot of attention to the buildings that we were proposing. And we were approaching this from a, a, a commission to do a master plan, not, not a landscape architectural proposal. Um, and I think that, again, I would encourage all of you, I, without, without a question of doubt, landscape architects are the best professionals to do urban design and master planning because you understand systems and how they interrelate. And that's something within, within traditional architectural uh, education has been a failing. It's starting to change now, but um, I, think, I still believe that landscape architects need to actually demand their seat at the table and say, uh, we know how to do this. Um, so I think the, the projects like this were experimentations of how we can take it, this idea, these ideas of you know, ecological urbanism and give it form and meaning. I have to say also, I should point out, a lot of these projects that I'm showing you um, were not 
um, were not implemented. And I show them because they were part of my own personal development. Um, uh, but I still feel that you need to actually push, uh, push those sort of narratives. This next project was for an education, uh, or re research and development park within Qatar, where it was physically separated from a lot of the city. Um, and I had an interesting program of, let's bring researchers together, how do you bring the world's best researchers? And the, the idea was actually, you know, it needs to be a place that you want to live in, a place that you want to work. You have to create chance interactions. And so we defined the structure of the master plan again through the establishment of this central park and this sort of pedestrian armature that made it far easier to walk than it would be to drive. So um, one of the drivers of this was the geometry um, that we determined, which came from a functional sort of exercise of where are people going, where are people coming from, and where are they going to? How does that then create sizes and modules of space that are suited to different uses? So one of the sort of opportunities that came about with this project is that um, there was no... Uh, one of the most important opportunities, I'd say, there was no uh, wastewater network, sewage, provided to the site. So the solution was, well, we'll build a pipeline that goes three kilometres away, we'll build a new mechanical treatment plant, and then we'll bring the water back and use it for irrigation water. And so we saw that as one of the opportunities of creating this sort of landscape framework that it becomes uh, functional, it does things for the city. So through a combination of things like wastewater treatment through reed beds, uh, through uh, saline agriculture, because we wanted to do research in the landscape, um, and, uh, and you know, a stormwater function for the landscape, that this becomes a sort of element that really sort of glues these things together with a research focus. We wanted to make research obvious and explicit. Um, and of course it was then sort of how we match that with sort of gathering spaces and how we create the moments of interaction for people, for researchers from different disciplines to come together. This next project um, is now going into an implementation, so it's one of the few. Um, and we were commissioned by a really enlightened architect who essentially just gave us the, the site and said, tell me what I should do. Um, and it was a really interesting site on a mountaintop above the city of Muscat, which is a really quite lovely, low-scale city in Oman. Um, but it was f physically separated from the city, and so we immediately started thinking about, well, is this an opportunity for a self-sufficient metropolis? Um, and so we, we explored that. What does that mean, and how do we, how do we make that happen? It had great views, but also the topography was an opportunity. And so one of the first things we did was look at water flow, because in this part of the world, it doesn't rain very often, but when it rains, the water has nothing to slow it down. So you get uh, torrential flows. So the water system had to be the basis of everything. And so, you know, through scripting, we just sort of figured out things like, where are those flows? How do we manage those? If we are to intervene in that, where do we intervene in it? Um, you know, the topography also meant what was buildable and what was not. And there was a lot of the site that wasn't buildable. Um, and then we, um, particularly, this is where we really started toying a lot with um, scripting and uh, grasshopper and what we could do. So, you know, defining things like um, road, road paths that don't exceed 10, uh, 10 degrees. So generating through software applications, you know, framework elements. Um, equally, uh, where would there be, you know, pedestrian-friendly uh, areas that we could define? And these, these geometries kind of got overlaid, and they became the, the sort of framework for the project. Um, what we then started looking at doing is what were the infrastructural opportunities in the landscape? And so we had a structure for the project. We had an idea of how much infrastructure was needed, and it was then about how do we deploy landscape systems how do we sort of look at traditional systems, which in, in the Gulf, there was a tradition of very, very careful water management, how that relates to agriculture. Um, and so we, we sort of were inspired by that. 
Um, we looked at opportunities like because of the topography, because of the water flow, um, how could we do things like create a, create a small dam that, that prevented downstream flooding, but also provided an opportunity for hydroelectric uh, energy? And then when we take wastewater out of the development, how do we treat it on site, on, on the location where it, it's being generated, and then allow that to also replenish these water systems? Because a lot of the time the infrastructure is separated. Um, and then uh, basically uh, looking at sort of public realm structures that allowed you to move across this site uh, and have sort of great access to public open space, which is obviously something we should almost always do. And, and that sort of composite of all of these elements um, provided us a, a sort of armature, but also allowed us to work through things like net zero energy solution for the, that combined the hydroelectricity with, with solar. Um, and how we would sort of manage things like storage. So this next, and I promise I'm getting through the projects, I'm not, I'm not too far from finishing. Um, the, this next project was originally a commission that came to us from the mayor of a, a, a small city in, in Turkey, Antalya, um, who wanted to build a marina in the mouth of the river and couldn't understand why the river keeps flooding. Well, the river kept flooding, as you'll see, because it's actually the topography of the place, the, the, the landscape of the place leads to those situations. So we identified the things that were interesting to us and said, look, you need to think bigger. So let's not just do a plan for how you build a marina. Let's look at how you look at this entire landscape. Your city's about to double in population in 20 years. So let us give you a solution to that as well. A and that's another really key thing, a key learning point for me over my career. Be bold. Step way beyond your brief. Uh, often, people don't know what they don't know. If you can actually show them a solution that they hadn't even contemplated, they will more often than, than not let you go for it. And this was one of those situations. Um, so we had a really strong emphasis in this around restoring biodiversity and ecological systems, protecting the water supply, because the creek that ran, that was the subject of this, was the only supply of potable water for the city. It was already getting incursion of salt water from sea level rise. It was getting polluted by the agricultural uses uh, in, in part of the city. So there was a sort of very strong landscape dynamic that we saw in the, in the formation of it. So we zoomed out from the site to uh, uh, the entire watershed um, and eventually zoomed into about 60 square kilometres for the actual master plan. And even if you are doing that just to understand your localised condition, it's, it's something that's obviously well worth doing. We were given no basis for the plan, so we had to generate everything. So there was a mapping exercise where we looked at all of the urban fabric and what was, what was built. Um, but probably more importantly um, was the, the landscape dynamics that we looked at. And first and foremost of, of that was things like hydrology and top topography. And that led us to understand why is the river flooding and how do you manage that? Um, topography obviously related to buildability. Um, but this sort of com combination, this exercise, showed us in geometry terms, again through a scripting exercise, where do we intervene in the water cycle so that you slow down the water in the watershed? So we sort of identified all of these points in the watershed where there was a control point where you could detain water, you could prevent flooding downstream. Um, at the same time, there were historic orange groves in this city. So we started mapping the field boundaries of those orange groves because we, we thought they should be kept. Um, and they had a strong sort of correlation with the water cycles, as you would expect. Um, so when we started putting those geometries together, that suggested some sort of geometric framework that we then sort of took to be the, the planning logic for the city. And so... Um, we used those sort of influences to define what we called the environmental loops, um, which framed eventually where development went. 
It was only then we started looking at typical infrastructure issues like, you know, where do you need a bridge? Where does there need to be some water infrastructure? Um, and and I, I, again, I think that's a key thing. Think about the landscape first uh, because you'll, you'll always find a framework there and there will always be things that you layer on top and it's much easier to layer on top urban systems than it is to sort of try and correlate after thinking in urban structure systems. I think I've put too many slides in and I've exhausted the battery of the clicker. Um, so these were the environmental loops that we were talking about. And so the, the planning framework for the city was based on these. And they were experiential. So um, this was a, the, the, the whole place has something like 400 coastal resorts. So it was experiential in terms of opening up other tourism opportunities, but it was also a planning framework that if you had, if you're a landowner in the city and you had a parcel that was attached to those environmental loops, you could develop that parcel, but there was, it was a quid pro quo scenario. You can develop that parcel, but you need to do sustainable urban drainage systems in order to allow development of those sites. So it was sort of linking, um, you know, a, a benefit, a benefit to the wider population to something that's done for the health uh, of the city and the landscape. This whole exercise ended up with um, a series of infrastructure projects, and there were 12 like bridges and roads, uh, and 45 development projects. Um, and those, those we, we sort of explored as design exercises, some of these development projects. But what was sort of, I think, interesting um, and, and quite um, important was we identified those, those sites, and you see on the right-hand side, there's a column that says urban typology, and then there's a column that says hydraulic function. Every single development site was given a role within the hydraulic function. And so this is bringing water and its, its healthy use into urban planning. And that has to be something that we start um, conjoining. Urban planners, speaking from the, the perspective of someone who was trained as an urban planner, do not understand natural systems. And so they do not really take it into account in urban planning. So this sort of, we gave expression by showing example projects. Uh, sorry, I went a bit too far then. Um, that showed how we did things like create wetland um, areas that ran through development projects um, and how you could sort of use an urban development as a filter between an agricultural zone and a water course. Um, so simply sort of showing those helps to, to convince a, a client that, yes, I understand this is still possible and feasible and we can make a profit doing it. The, this next couple of projects jump scale a lot. And this was a, a project for a, a sort of vision master plan for a new city in, in the Arabian region. Um, and we took similar approaches to, to this. I stress we didn't win the competition, um, but it was work that, that we sort of are quite proud of because of what it did in terms of foregrounding things like the role of landscape. When you're talking about something that's the scale of the size of Belgium, basically, that um, there's, a, there's a, uh, a challenge in first to understand that place. And this was where we sort of had to use sort of a GIS uh, framework to actually understand the site by splitting it into one square kilometre pixels and sort of combining these across things like uh, natural climatic uh, and built environment to start to understand suitability of where should we build things. Um, but there was also these incredible heritage sites across this. So how do they, how do they fold in? So this was such a complex, multi-layered element. The, the next part was biodiversity. And it happened to be a, a quite rich biodiversity site where it was on bird flyways. There was good mapping of the ecologies, which tied to what we had found in our GIS analysis. And again, this starts to suggest, um, you know, form ideas. Um, and so a lot of the planning for the project came down to these landscape typologies and we characterised it as, as growing a region, not building a city. Uh, and we sort of advocated this idea of a sort of acupunctural uh, kind of approach. 
where you're responding to the landscape rather than saying, I need to build X amount, so I will put it there. So this sort of acupuncture approach was sort of saying, well, where should we put things? How do they link as a network? And this, this whole place is a network. It's a system of places rather than a city. Um, and so the idea was really using projects as a catalyst, letting them establish, and then uh, allowing that to grow further into what could be broadly described as a city. Um, but everything was based on uh, also, how do we do better than just less damage? How do we create an environment that has better water retention, that, um, that will lead to better vegetation, so that leads to better biodiversity? So th this sort of seeded this idea of not just doing less damage, but how can we make a place that is more productive than the undeveloped place? Um, and so in infrastructure terms, we purposely started planning on generating more energy than was needed. And how could that then uh, form part of a regional system and eventually a system to export excess energy? Um, and for us, we, we sort of thought that if you're talking about futuristic, it's not just um, being net zero, it's actually generating more than you need or sequestering more carbon than you create. So um, that sort of included as an explicit goal this idea that we, we ended up calling plus urbanism, where you're always generating more than your need. And then that it gets exported to surrounding areas. So, and I think that's a fundamental idea in terms of climate change. You know, even if we stopped now uh, all emissions of carbon, we still have a problem. So if we don't think about projects sort of moving into that negative emissions territory, then we still won't address the problem that we have. A follow-on project from that one was actually where the same client asked us to look at what does the landscape of this place look like in 30 years? And they, it was purely a visual exercise. So from this starting point of being exterior decorators and say, what does it look like? We started by actually questioning, well, what is it that you're planning to do about energy, food, water, carbon? And they didn't have a solution. And again, I'll call out that this, this was something that we did together with MSP and Marcus was sort of uh, intimately involved in this, in this project. Um, so we sort of stepped again far beyond the boundaries of what we were asked to do and tried to find this sort of set of nested systems where we thought at biosphere scale about how this project could potentially address um, you know, all aspects of sustainability. Um, and, and that led us to things like natural capital approaches, um, where we sort of purposely, and, and this was an area where we played with this idea of cyborg landscapes. The towers that you see in the middle, middle ground there are actually uh, carbon capture machines. So we were looking at, because the, the, we had aspirations to sort of be at least net zero in carbon, it meant that you couldn't do it through just nature-based solutions, so it was enhancing nature. And they were... They were things that we wanted to put into the, the imagery so that that was understood. And we based it all on a, a, essentially a manifesto that said, we're not simply going to just do business as usual. We're going to be aspirational. Let's meet all of the nationally determined contributions of the country in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, and then we start to think about the sites and the systems for those sites. But this is an enormous task. You know, how do we actually make sense of that? And I'm going to show you the systems that we use to make sense of that. And I'm rapidly running out of time, so I'm going to try and go through this as quickly as possible. But first, first step was mapping habitats through remote, remote sensing, uh, actually classifying all those habitats in a GIS database, classifying their health, describing each of those habitats, and then starting to look at where do we deploy nature-based systems, where do we deploy mechanical systems, so that uh, we can sort of achieve these goals. With all of those things in place, we can then start to tell you what this landscape looks like. So when we know where everything is and what it looks like, then we'll tell you what, what the landscape identity is. One of the things that, that we sort of did at that stage was create this digital natural capital account, which actually provided an economic value for all of the ecosystem services, which then got tied to a green finance strategy. So essentially, a lot of the green finance options that are there 
require you to demonstrate you're doing what you say you're going to do. And th these were sort of the mechanisms through which we could do that. So this became a really fundamentally important part because it allowed the client to actually then go out and source green finance, carbon credits, uh, payments for ecosystem services. A and so many of uh, the people that we speak to now are intrigued by that idea but know nothing about it. Um, and I was sort of at this time that we were working on it. This was when the owner of Patagonia gifted the three billion uh, euro of net worth of his company to the earth. And so we see this sort of very strong, we, again, I think it, it comes to some of the points that Natalie was making. You need to link economy to this whole scenario. Um, and, and so we sort of mapped out what are the green finance opportunities? How does that play into, uh, into this? Um, what, was, what we did was sort of use a kind of a, a dashboard approach that interrelates things. So one quick example, if you generate food, you need water. If you need water, that needs energy to make the water. Uh, and then you need to actually treat that wastewater. They're all interrelated. So we had to find a way to interrelate those things and then generate the areas that were required for all of the infrastructure. So there was a whole set of things that we did here for the first time that um, transformed certainly my way of thinking about that utility and, and the, the medium of landscape. Um, and then it was sort of looking at things like components that we could deploy and how that relates to sort of these natural capital stories. Um, and only then, at the very end of that process, we visualised the outcome. Um, so that was sort of visualised intentionally through, and sometimes through diagramming, so that you understood systems rather than image. Um, uh, and then led to a set of design guidelines to guide the development uh, of sort of landscape typologies in future. Um, I did have a couple of other projects to run through, but I, I, we've run out of time, so I'm going to sort of just conclude it in terms of saying that there was a, key, a few key things that I've learned from the, these processes. And the first thing is that you really just need to think about ecology as the, the very first underlying basis of all urban planning. You need to think about buildings as a component of the landscape. And ideally, the idea of sort of metabolic buildings that are ecologically interacting with its environment. Uh, and be bold and step way beyond your brief. You'll always get pulled back, but you'll, you'll never go any way further if you don't try. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for... Um filling the basket even a little bit more. Actually, uh, I, I, I personally would, uh, I hope we have the chance in the afternoon or tonight to discuss a few of these projects. Because um, of course there's a lot of huge industries out there and they, they sell us a lot of, how can I say, beautiful graphics and a lot of interesting visualizations and so on. And for uh, the policymakers, it's sometimes hard to differentiate what is a really valuable approach and what is how can I say, a cloud of buzzwords to, to be very, very rough. Um, and that means that's something we have to be super, I guess, super careful uh, to discuss that. Uh, hopefully we can get there um, tonight to this kind of discussion. But are there any immediate questions right now? One question uh, should be possible before we go into the lunch break. No one dares asking a question. Natalie, of course, go ahead. Thank you, Stephen. A really interesting talk. And one of your main points that you bring forth is that we need to be planning with nature first and really thinking of nature and ecology as infrastructural. Yep. But how does this actually work in implementation? And how do you get your seat at the table? How do you convince decision makers and financers to actually do that? Fake it till you make it. Um, I'm, I'm kidding a little bit there. Um, the, you have to actually be able to, to speak to your audience. And so if you're speaking to a developer, you know, you can't tell them nature-based solutions are wonderful and they'll make you feel happy and warm because they don't care. But if you tell them 
you can avail, there, there is something, the estimates at the moment are something like, there's $27 trillion worth of green finance available at the moment. Um, and, you know, at the scale of big projects, even just a, a, a reduced interest rate for green infrastructure loans makes a fundamental difference. So you kind of have to relate it to who you're speaking to. When you're talking to sort of countrywide decision makers or something like that, you can talk in platitudes. You can say this is the right thing to do and they care. But you actually have to sort of think about who you're speaking to and what they care about and eventually be able to find the linkages between all of those things, which is what I found really interesting about your presentation, that you actually have to find linkages between things social, environmental, economical, um, and, and technological, that, that only then you can really start to answer those questions. And you've got to have confidence when you're, when you're selling something that even if you don't know it works, just get yourself the next step along the, the process. And it, uh, it, that's the best advice I can offer. It's, it's, it's not a science, it's a kind of art in a way. Another question? Lonia? Yeah. So, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very uh, rich to see all these projects and what can be done actually on paper and, uh, and on site. So, but there is a, a question that keeps on coming into my mind up to now before going to, to lunch is that so we try to, to change, we try to mitigate all these changes that we, that we, we did for, uh, in, on the landscape and that caused the climate change. And now the question that comes to my mind is that nowadays it seems that we still try to change the landscape and we still try to find a way to, 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 to reverse these changes. But what guarantees that we are not going to fall back into this kind of uh, mistakes that we've done, if we can call it mistakes, and we are not turning around into this vicious circle, if we can guarantee that? I think that's an excellent question, and I don't have a definitive answer for you. I mean, I actually look at some of Ilse's work and think, actually, it tells me a story about be careful about what you do, because you could up, end up with unintended consequences. And that's known. And I guess at the moment, we're measuring risk of not doing anything against the risk of doing something, and you're not sure exactly what might happen out of that. And I think I'm driven by this idea that the urgency is so great, we have to try some things. But, you know, if you understand ecology, you understand that leads to the mother of all mistakes, you know. It, 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 it's, it's something where you have to sort of be able to think uh, not as a designer of a place that gets built and then it's finished, but you're the creator of a system that needs to be monitored in perpetuity after that. And some of these mechanisms, like the natural capital accounting system, gives you a means to do that. Because let's say you're a developer who got $10 billion of um, green finance. You don't just get the finance and then it's done. You have to actually demonstrate that the biodiversity is increasing, there's, there's greater biomass, there's, there's no uh, sort of pest elements in there. So there has to be monitoring systems. So we can sell an amazing idea, uh, but what I'm starting to see now in the later part of my career is that, that you, you've got to actually... You're, you're a custodian, and you'll never not be a custodian. You have to kind of either be able to satisfy yourself that someone is looking after that, or you've got to take ownership and do it yourself. 